Thank you, and thank you for that very warm welcome. Apologies to all of you who've been waiting so patiently. Professor Stiglitz has got an education in the vagaries of London traffic, <laughs> courtesy <laughs> of this afternoon. But we, so we're, we're up to speed. We're going to be learning, though, from you this afternoon. I thought I would just say something about our format. Uh, Professor Stiglitz and I will be in conversation up here for two-thirds or just less than that of our time. And then I'm going to open it up for very much questions rather than long speeches from the floor. And I'll be picking up bunches of two or three of those and then bringing them back to Joseph for uh, his responses. And we'll try and do, really get, hear as many voices as we can. But I thought, particularly because the clock is ticking, we would get straight into it. And note that we're just five days away from the anniversary of Lehman Brothers collapsing on the 15th of September uh, 2008. And there were lots of people who felt that this was, you know, what 9-11 what was to geopolitics, 9-15 was <laughs> for the global economy. Uh, so one decade on, I, I, I wanted to ask you if you think we are still in the shadow of that event and whether there are lessons that even now, 10 years on, we still haven't learned from that event. Well, clearly, I, th I think we are in the shadow of that event. I think the politics uh, in the United States uh, and probably elsewhere uh, has been greatly affected by how we manage the crisis. I think some of the, the anger, uh, the Tea Party movement, uh, and what followed in, in, in terms of Trump, was motivated or it was certainly uh, in, uh, amplified by the sense that those who caused the crisis, the bankers, got off almost scot-free and uh, the uh, millions of people lost their homes, tens of millions lost their jobs around the world. Uh, it, it seemed unjust, and it was. So I think it, it really has affected our, our politics. Uh, and so you know, I, I think there was a real mistake in the way uh, the Democratic administration in the United States handled it, but I think uh, uh, globally, there was a problem. I mean, just no. on, on that point about the political reaction, and it may go to what you just said about the Democratic administration, which you mean the Obama administration, which obviously came in within a few months of the crash. Everything you just described there about the bankers getting away scot-free and ordinary people yeah. suffering would have led one to assume, and some of us did assume, that the reaction politically would be a left populism, that it would be movements and parties of the left who were championing that argument that would flourish, and actually what we see, and you mentioned Donald Trump, is that it's parties of the right who have flourished and gained. There's elections today in Sweden, it looks as if that's going that way too. It's parties of the right who've benefited in this decade since the crash. How do you figure that? Well, part of the answer is that a lot of electorates saw the parties in the left and the parties of the right, the Bush administration, Obama administration, uh, no, hardly a, a difference between the two, at least on this critical issue. And, and if you looked at the chief of uh, the people involved in the early years of the Obama administration, uh, Geithner was very closely linked, uh, and Summers were both very closely linked with the deregulation movement uh, in the 90s. Geithner, of course, being the Treasury Secretary for Obama, and Larry Summers, the economic advisor. And, and the third one was Bernanke, who was the head of the Federal Reserve, who had been Bush's chief economic advisor. So it, it looked as if it didn't matter which party you were in, uh, th there was an elite, an establishment, and uh, that led to an anti-establishment. I don't think it was obvious that the anti-establishment would go be so successful on, on the right, but it's worth noting that the anti-establishment on the left, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Warren, has been very successful as well. So I think what you see is the, uh, the center which, held, which was viewed to uh, blamed for the crisis and for the way it was mishandled, uh, leading to uh, the two sides. I think in Europe, um, things are a little bit different. Uh, I think there are uh, uh, two uh, issues that were uh, critical. Uh, one of them was the Euro. Um, you know, I've explained in my book, The Euro, why the single currency uh, couldn't work 
without having more institutions. And uh, I think it really is to blame in Europe, uh, in the continental Europe, for uh, the set of policies uh, that led to um, the depressions, the recessions, and the politicians of the center left and the center right stood by, side by side in, in defending the euro mm -hmm. and again uh, defending austerity, uh, defending the policies of deregulation, of globalization. And so again, from the outside, it seemed as if there was no di difference and you moved to the left or the, the extreme left or the extreme right. Now, what has made a big difference uh, in Europe and a little bit in the United States, although for other reasons, uh, is migration. Uh, the migration crisis of 2015, you know, having to do with Syria. Um, I think the center left, for very good reasons, uh, couldn't be as nasty as the right. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it just, it's, it's uh, genetically difficult for the left to be uh, nativist, to be, uh, they find it difficult seeing people suffer. And the right doesn't seem to mind that. So, <laughs> and you're saying the center left don't seem to mind that either. You're saying center left governments are also tough on migrants. Um, the center left has, has been trying to struggle to figure out what to, what what to, to do, say, what, what to, to do. say about mm -hmm. this. Because I think, I know their heart is in the right place, but they're, there's a political battle. Uh, so that has left the opening for the extreme right to, to take over. And that migration and, point is not, I know you were broadly talking about Europe, but that of course is a huge factor in Trump and the United States as well, even though there wasn't the huge movement of refugees that we saw in Europe from Syria and elsewhere, yeah, there that, wasn't an equivalent in, in, in America. That was why I distinguished between yeah. Europe and America, because Europe did have a problem. Yeah. Uh, the case of Trump, uh, America did not have a migration. You know, uh, you all know that Trump made a big deal about the wall between Mexico and the United States, but uh, for 10 years, almost 10 years before uh, the 2016 election, we haven't had any migration from, uh, from Mexico. And the joke has been actually the wall would keep Mexicans from going back to Mexico. You know, the, the flow has been the, the, the other way. Um, Why then did it resonate so strongly for Trump in 2016? Well, I think it goes back to fear that uh, we, um, beginning for 20, 25 years, we had globalization, um, financial liberalization, uh, things that were promised to be a benefit to everybody. And what we wound up with was deindustrialization. And rather than to say um, the problems within ourselves, that we didn't manage that process well, uh, that we should have help people move out of the sectors that were in decline uh, in the way that some other countries have done a better job than the United States. For example, who's done a good well, job? Well, uh, Sweden <laughs> has done a better job, but <laughs> it's still... where it's called there. <laughs> exactly. So that's, uh, <laughs> but in general, uh, it, in, ter in terms of actually managing the deindustrialization process, they clearly have done a better job. Mm. Um, and we didn't do that. Uh, and in fact, um, the Democratic Party, uh, Clinton, um, when NAFTA was passed and with the other trade agreements, uh, made a big effort to try to get trade adjustment assistance. That was a core part of the platform. But when he couldn't get adequate assistance through, there was this blind faith that somehow the growth of the economy would trickle down to everybody and everybody would be better off. I mean, there was no theory behind trickle down economics. Economic theorists made it very clear that globalization without some form of assistance some, would lead to more inequality. You've got something which I think is a core uh, debate and it, it, was, it was a dispute even when your book, Globalization and Its Discontents, came out. And I, I just want to know where, where you stand on it if I 
you know, formulate it this way, which is that it seems to be there's one school of, of thought that uses the word you used earlier about that globalization can be managed and it can be made either more just or less unjust through state and it, tweaking and adjustments and training and all kinds of things. Uh, and I suppose in Britain that position was really associated with Gordon Brown when he was Prime Minister and Chancellor saying, our job is to manage globalization. And there is another view associated with the further left that would say, globalization is inherently unjust and therefore needs to be essentially reversed. It can't be managed, it's just wrong. Uh, explain to us where, either where you are now on this or how your own thinking is developed. Well, well, first let me say that there's a third scope which was, don't worry about things, trickle down economics. It, it makes the economy grow and, uh, uh, and, and everybody will benefit. Now that school has been pretty well discredited. Yeah. And so you're left with the two, two views that, that, you, uh, uh, that you've described. Um, the, I think what we n know from the current perspective is uh, two observations. Uh, the first is that the gains from globalization were exaggerated. And uh, this actually goes back to uh, the crisis of 2008. Um, it isn't automatic that uh, globalization will uh, benefit, with something I wrote in my book, Globalization and Discontents, for developing countries, quite often job destruction occurred faster and more intensely than job creation. And obviously, if job destruction occurs faster than job creation, uh, what was supposed to happen, moving people from low productivity to high productivity sectors, doesn't happen. You move from low productivity to zero productivity, unemployment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I described in Globalization and Discontents. And what happened in the West, in the United States, after especially after 2008, but even beginning 2002 with the admission of China, was more of that kind of thing, that uh, people move from low productivity to zero productivity. So you look in those part of the United States where we had more, uh, where, where they were producing goods that were in competition with goods that were part of the surge from China after China uh, got admitted to the WTO, um, you can see wages are lower, unemployment is higher, property values are lower. So empirically, the benefits were less, but that was partly because we didn't manage things well. Yeah. But the second point is that the distributive effects were greater. That is to say, even if there had been no unemployment, to keep jobs, wages would have to fall, particularly among skilled workers. And that means that even if uh, you maintain full employment, uh, there are big winners, but also very big losers, which can be a majority of the population. So uh, my view is, is all of this could have been managed. Um, that is to say, yes. if you had appropriate fiscal policies, uh, if you had uh, assistance, job assistance, you had uh, the, you might call it the right rules of the game, the right transfer programs, tax programs, uh, but we didn't have any of those. <laughs> so given that, it is not a surprise that things worked out so badly. Now, the final part of your question is, do I think we could, it is possible to have a good politics on this? And I have to say, I, I, I have to believe that we can, mm -hmm. but, uh, that's going to change, need, uh, say, in the United States, a success of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Which is obviously a big if. But, <laughs> al but also, um, this is action of the kind you've described would have to be internationally coordinated, wouldn't it? I mean, for globalization to be managed in a way that led to better outcomes, some of the mechanisms you were describing, they would have to be internationally agreed, wouldn't they? For the United States, I think we could manage the external effects ourselves. Mm. I think the EU could manage, uh, Europe could manage the external effects. For developing countries, they don't have any say and they don't have the resources. So I agree for the, their perspective, they need a, a, a global coordination. But our failure, I think, uh, in the United States 
was our own fault and our own politics. And, uh, um, and that's why, you know, rather, uh, Trump was successful because no one wants to blame yourself. And his agenda was to say, blame the Chinese, uh, the, blame the, Chinese, blame the Mexicans. Yeah. So uh, shift the effort, the blame elsewhere. Yes. We, we've been speaking, and then we'll, we'll move on to a different aspect of this in a moment. Just before we leave it, though, we've been speaking, and you have, in the past tense, is what we could have done, what could have been. Given where we are now, what, are, what is the sort of set of policy prescriptions that could be done, given that globalization is still with us, still happening, it's not in the past, what are the set of policy prescriptions either that the United States could do for American workers and European Union, and you know, that would include Britain for another few months at least, um, what that could be done here to mitigate the effects both in terms of zero productivity, unemployment, and you know, suppressed wages? So I, I think there, there needs to be a, a, a pretty comprehensive agenda which uh, begins with uh, rewriting the rules of our economy. I mean, this sounds pretty sounds grandiose, big, yeah. pretty big, but uh, recognizing, uh, you know, you began by talking about this being the 10th anniversary of, of the financial uh, collapse. Uh, the rules of the game of the financial sector have not really been adequately changed, and that has led to a short-term uh, focus that has led to uh, low investment in people, low investment in uh, uh, plant and equipment. Um, because why do it if you can get the work done cheaper in Mexico or China or elsewhere? Uh, uh, and, and why think long term? Uh, and, and we have this anom uh, anomalous result uh, situation where we have record share of profits, as a, uh, profits as a share of GDP, uh, and yet investment is very weak. And that's related to a second thing that's, I think, a very big issue in the United States and in many other countries, which is monopoly profit. Uh, we've, we've, uh, there are large pockets of, of monopolies. And, you know, Trump talks about, look, the stock market is going up so high. If you look at it, mm -hmm. it's not across the board. It's our big giants that are doing very well. So if Amazon and Apple are doing well or going through the roof, it looks as if the whole stock market is rising, but actually it's just these two or three giants. It's about five or six, but yeah. it's still a very, uh, not a broad base of our economy. And these sectors have very few employees in, in the United States. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the contrast, you know, between General Motors when it was the largest company in the United States and um, say Amazon, uh, say, say Apple, uh, uh, now a trillion dollar company, and it had, um, you know, something 50, 70,000 employees in the United States. That's, That's all. all. Yeah. And most of those are low paid uh, sales people. Uh, the number of actually high-paid employees is, is really, really small. So uh, that's a problem uh, for our economy. The third thing is we have uh, labor laws that have really weakened unions. And so you have uh, workers' wages being uh, pushed down, prices being pushed up by monopoly power, real wages therefore going down even more, uh, a larger and larger share of the national income going to a relatively, uh, a relatively few. Um, so those are some of the examples. Then we have corporate governance problems where the CEOs can take a larger and larger share of a corporate income for themselves and then say, uh, 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 there's no more money for investment because they just paid themselves. And then they explain, you know, firing people is really unpleasant. So, uh, and we have to fire people because we don't have any money because I just paid myself so much, but I need to pay myself that much because I have such an unpleasant job firing everybody. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but the, the point about that, you don't get growth out so of that. Your, your mention of both Amazon and, well, Apple are part of this too, but also that phenomenon of, you know, the people at the very, very top being paid astronomical sums. 
I wanted to put this to you. There are people here, it's only a handful, but it's just sort of indicative of, of younger people, particularly associated with the left, who've begun speaking warmly, something gets sort of tongue-in-cheek about communism again, you know, saying, yes, I'm a communist. And I want, you know, I, 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 where that might come from is interesting, but short of a full-scale state takeover of the likes of Amazon or Apple, what can be done to combat that degree of gross inequality, and Amazon is such a good case of it because, on the one hand, it's a trillion dollar company. Jeff Bezos says he just cannot, b barring space exploration, he cannot think of what to do with all this money. On the, and that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, people know, and there's been some brilliant reporting by James Bloodworth and other journalists, that the people who are actually doing the work at Amazon are paid, uh, you know, and, and live in, and work in almost intolerable conditions and are paid so little and have such precarious... Uh, working life. So you, people are resorting to looking at um, extreme solutions, and I mentioned the communist one partly just to sort of put it up in lights, but that's surely because they cannot see a way through a remedy for such grotesque or gross inequality. People pay tuppence halfpenny an hour at the one hand, and on the other hand, these sort of astronomical sums for Jeff Bezos. If, if, com you know, if full state takeover isn't the answer, what is the answer? Well, so I, I think it's Two things. One, the thing I've been emphasizing which is, so far, which is rewriting the rules of the economy. You know, markets don't exist in a vacuum, yeah. and we've created a peculiar 21st century capitalism that really isn't functioning very well. But you could rewrite the rules and make that economy both more equitable and more efficient, more dynamic. And so all the proceeds don't go to a relatively few. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, it's not inevitable. It's part of our politics where you have, mm. especially in the United States, where money affects uh, our political system so much, and then they write the rules. They write the rules in ways that limit the ability to go after the monopolist, the, uh, the, limit the ability to, to balance the labor versus uh, capital. Uh, when you say they write the rules, in the in American case, it really is literally like that, where monopolists might have hired lobbyists who literally sit in the offices of the legislators writing, writing the, the law. Rules. The, 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 you, again, to go back to the Lehman Brothers moment, uh, where the collapse of the financial sector, critical in this were the derivatives. And uh, as part of Dodd-Frank that was passed in 2010, which was the, the bill that tried to regulate the financial sector that didn't go far enough, 75% uh, of Americans thought it didn't go far enough. And yet, as soon as that was, the ink was dry, the banks started a campaign to roll it back. And in 2015, the critical, a critical provision that deal, dealt with the derivatives and the CDSs, those were those yeah. dangerous products that led to a $180 billion bailout of one company, AGI, uh, AIG. And, uh, you know, the, the more money than we expent, you know, I don't know, uh, $180 billion is a lot of money. Yeah. I, I, just to make uh, you understand that, yeah. that, that more money than we expent on all of individual welfare for, for years and years went to one corporate company. welfare, to one company. And it was all based on these derivatives and CDSs. Citibank wrote the amendment repealing that provision that government should not be, uh, that government insured uh, banks and other agencies should not uh, be writing these dangerous products. Um, and they got it through Congress. So that was a, a, a good example where, where it was just, it was right off of Citibank, written by them. I mean, at the time, we're just going back now to the 20, 2008 situation, but at the time, that degree of corporate welfare, as you call it, these bailouts, were justified because these companies were too big to fail, and the fear was that if they collapsed, they would take the entire financial system down with them. Looking back on it now, do you think they should have been allowed to fail? Should AIG have been, not been bailed out, and the others, and everything that you know, Gordon Brown in this country and Hank Paulson in the United States, they all did to save the financial system over that critical weekend, was that actually a mistake? Should we have let the whole thing f collapse? No, I, I, I don't think we should have let the whole thing collapse uh, because 
you know, the analogy was made, and I think it was partly correct, that, that the financial sector is like the blood of a, an economic system, and if uh, firms didn't have access to finance, households didn't have access to finance, the whole economic system would uh, seize, and uh, unemployment would soar even yeah. more. But the question was how you did it. Uh, we could have saved the banks, but not save the bankers, the shareholders, the bondholders. So my criticism, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, my criticism is the way we did it. Mm. And uh, we could have protected the banking, the financial system. Uh, sometimes people call this uh, pre-privatization. We would have nationalized it. Yeah. And then eventually, maybe, reprivatized it. But the b basic point is there was no reason that we had to give so much money uh, to the bankers and uh, to the shareholders and the bondholders. And, and that was the critical mistake. And to go back to, to what we began our conversation with is in terms of the, the political fallout, anger at that is, I think, one of the factors in the current uh, political malaise. I think you're absolutely right. There are two political questions, poli you know, political economy questions that come out of this before we get onto the subject that's brought you here to London. Um, the first one is as a, as a response from politicians. We were talking about opposition to globalization, and I, I sort of took it as read that the opposition I had in mind was from the left. But the other opposition is the one articulated by Donald Trump and his move against free trade and against globalization itself, really, in the form of protectionism and bringing back tariffs. Um, we can see that as a response to globalization too. Um, it's sort of, by people who are opposed to Trump, it's taken as read that that's a very bad thing and that the and people look back in sort of their economic history textbooks and things, it leads, it has very bad consequences. Are people right to be as nervous as they are about this return to protectionism and Donald Trump's uh, fondness for tariffs? Uh, yes, I think they are. I mean, I, I think, uh, what we need, obviously, as I said before, we, we need some system of social protection. But protectionism is not the answer mm. to that kind of social protection. Another way of putting it is that uh, the people who are going to be most hurt by the move to protectionism will be the very people who were hurt by deindustrialization in the first place. Because uh, the, the jobs that remain what we did after uh, we moved into globalization is construct fairly efficient global supply chains. And now if we interrupt those global supply chains, those countries like the United States where they are interrupting them will be at a disadvantage. Yeah. And so uh, our auto industry will be hurt. And that's why you know, it's, it's interesting. The pe many of the people involved in the industries both the unions and the companies are actually against Trump's policies. And often it means the very people who voted for Trump in Michigan, Wisconsin, other places are being hurt by his we'll supposed remedies. And, yeah. and then there's the secondary repercussions. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, you can't go into protectionism without re expecting response from your trading partners. So China now has raised its tariffs on, uh, uh, on American agricultural goods uh, and other goods from the United States. Yeah. And so lots of other parts of our country are going to be hurt. Um, and a lot of these, you know, uh, lots of parts of our economy are fairly competitive, which means their margins are very small. And in agriculture, your price goes down by 5%. It's a difference between being profitable and going under. So there is a lot of anxiety right now in large parts of the country about what will happen. And um, there's an additional uh, layer of problems with the way Trump negotiates, which is uh, he makes an agreement and then uh, reneges. So nobody knows, you know, how, uh, he thinks he's a great bargainer, uh, negotiator, but everybody else views him as untrustworthy. So 
I think most of them are just trying to do what they can yeah. to uh, postpone things until he's gone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, those who are making agreements... I mean, I, uh, it's not just the trading partners who feel that way, I think. <laughs> I think that's right. That Everybody. could be the world's population you're describing. It's feeling, it's um, <laughs> the, the second sort of political consequence I, 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 is in a way more stark, and that is, and again, I said it's sort of a bit like what we know from our history textbooks, but you know, the people know that there was a decade that separated the Wall Street crash in 1929 with the outbreak of World War 10 years later. And how fearful of you that even now, a decade on, that the crash of 2008 could still bring reverberations, even quite catastrophic ones, or are we kind of out of the woods 10 years on? No, I, I don't think we are out of the woods. As I said before, uh, we haven't really addressed the economics of re-regulating the financial sector to make it safe. I mean, we, we've done a few things, but then we, we pulled back on those things, and uh, um, uh, you know, I was uh, at a dinner uh, shortly before the inauguration of Trump uh, at, uh, at, at the British consulate, and one of the people there was, was one of the uh, Trump's advisors. And uh, he was uh, looking forward, he, he asserted that we are going to uh, deregulate the financial sector. He was from the financial sector. Uh, and uh, somebody at the, in, at the dinner said, uh, you know, didn't we have a crisis in 2008? Uh, and tried to remind him. But that was ancient history and uh, didn't want to talk about that. And this is sort of off topic, but <laughs> given the huge mandate he had, why didn't Obama do that? There was a real moment there where he came in, he was elected right in the teeth or in the eye of the storm. What he could have done, the moment was there. I know that, you know, because he says so in his book and other things, Gordon Brown here in London was urging him to do it. Why didn't he do it? I think the, the people around him had this theory that I think was clearly wrong, that uh, we had had a little bump in our economy. Basically, uh, everything was fine. And our hospital, our, 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 uh, our uh, banks were a little sick. Uh, they needed to be nurtured, to be back to health. And nurturing meant giving them a trillion dollars, you know. Um, and uh, nurturing also meant, you know, when somebody's sick, you don't scold them and make them depressed. So don't say anything nasty to them. Um, sort of tell them, you know, you're 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 really good people. Um, so you, they their spirits will be lifted. And you think Obama bought that? I think he did. Mm. I think the the people around him really bought that. Uh, I think he was a little bit more mixed in his own feelings, but so uh, the result was, uh, you know, they thought it was going, they really thought it was going to be a short uh, downturn. I think they misdiagnosed totally what the problems were. And so they thought a year and a half, we're back to 2007 and uh, let's not make a big deal about this little interruption and in our economy, just, you know, let's go on, get on with it. So I think that's, that, that, that idea had a lot of influence. And I think the other one was, Obama was basically conservative. And uh, he wasn't there to change the economic system in the way that uh, FDR yeah. saw 29 as a real evidence that something was wrong. And when he got elected and you know, took office in 33, said, we need to have social security, we need to yeah. change our labor laws. Um, you know, he really tried to change uh, our securities regulation. He, it was a moment of redefining American capitalism. And in a way, Obama missed that moment. And he missed that under, moment. Under his faith. We, we are going to open up a question. Just before we do, I want to hear you just perhaps briefly on the subject that's brought you here, you're giving a lecture, I think, on Tuesday uh, about artificial intelligence and the economy. And you've given, you've already sort of offered this warning that we did, and you've explained very well just in the conversation we've had here now, how we misread or underestimated the challenges of globalization. And you've issued this warning that we mustn't make the same mistake with artificial intelligence. Uh, in, in, in what I've read of what you've said about that, you, you're not as a sort of blanket pessimist about AI as some people are. 
to me as a lay person, I can see how artificial intelligence can remove jobs altogether. Driverless cars is the most, or driverless vehicles will immediately get rid of all those jobs involving people driving trucks or cabs, etc. cetera. Uh, and I'm struggling to see how it might add jobs, but tell us why you're not as sort of um, bleak on AI as some of us might be. Okay, so th there, there are two parts of this. One is that uh, AI is just one of a series of ways in which uh, we've increased our productivity. And we, this has been, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been increasing productivity. And what that means is the size of our economic pie is that much larger. Yeah. So if we have a bigger economic pie, we can uh, all be better off in principle. Uh, and, you know, if, if we hadn't had the Industrial Revolution, you know, the, the changes that have happened in the last 250 years are really astounding. You know, for hundreds of years before that, as far as history goes, standards of living were constant, life expectancy was very low, and then as a result of innovation, we've really yes. reached a different plane. So this is another step in that, and we have a bigger pie. The big challenge is how we divide it. And the real risk is the same as the risk of globalization, that as we get a bigger pie, it gets divided even more unequally. So the slice that goes to the bottom half is not only a smaller share, but actually a smaller slice. So that, to me, is the, is the real issue. Now, um, So in other words, we can all see how Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos might do brilliantly out of this. Very hard to see how everyone else who's already struggling, when they're not even doing a job, right? Because there's, at the moment, the issue for a driver might be that they're, getting, they're doing a low-paid job. If a driverless vehicle comes along, they've got no job at all. It's hard to see how they can get any slice of this pie. Well, you know, there will be some jobs that will disappear. Uh, and it's not just at the bottom, uh, radiologists, uh, the people who read uh, your uh, MRIs. Uh, machines actually do a better job than humans in reading these. And that's because it's repetitious. They're, they're really good at what's called signal detection and, 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 and learning yeah. of, of a particular sort of pattern recognition. Pattern recognition. So in that, they, they actually do a better job. And that's why uh, uh, some people are optimistic that eventually, not yet, driverless cars will actually be safer than uh, 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 drivered uh, cars. But so far, that's not true. I mean, they, 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 uh, some of the stories about where there's been accidents, uh, they couldn't uh, read a bicycle, a, a woman walking a bicycle. They didn't know, they knew, they could read a bicycle, somebody riding on a bicycle, and they could read somebody walking, but they hadn't been programmed to read somebody walking a bicycle, and, and so they hit the person. Um, so there are some problems yet. Uh, yeah. But the, uh, what I want to emphasize is two things. One is there are some innovations that actually are what I call uh, uh, not only uh, replacing labors but, uh, labors, but actually augmenting labors, making us more productive. Uh, doctors that, with new technology, can diagnose us better. Uh, so there are lots of ways... So you've also suggested, haven't you, that the people who, okay, we won't have as many drivers or other things, but we could, for example, redeploy those people, retrain them into jobs that require human skills. Exactly. So, so the point is that there are, uh, we're going to have an aging population, uh, and some of us are very sensitive about that, and, uh, and uh, that is going to require a care people. Uh, we are underinvesting in our young people. We could have smaller classrooms. One of the things that we know uh, uh, leads to better educational outcome is smaller classrooms. Uh, if we paid better salaries for caring for our aged, for caring for our sick, for caring for our young, uh, that could drive up wages in the economy as a whole. Now, that means if you could tax uh, 
the pure pro- the monopoly profits that I described before, yeah. if you tax the intellectual property rents that come off of AI, uh, if you uh, change the intellectual property rules themselves as one of the rules we're talking about, and you share the benefits of that innovation more widely in our society, then uh, those advances would would re- could result in everybody being better off. And so it comes back again to our politics of how we're going to manage uh, AI and whether we'll manage it in ways that a few people do very well or in which all of us do better. And that requires a collective effort of rewriting these rules, not just leaving it to the tech companies themselves. That's just something we yeah. haven't got into. But I, I do want to open it, because we might come back to that. But let's open it up. Uh, I think we have people with microphones. There's somebody there. The gentleman there has got his hand up very quickly. Um, any hands over here? Um, there's the lady there, I think. Keep your hand up. Yeah, keep it down. Keep it up so the person here sees it. And I'll come back to somebody else in a moment. Yeah, let's go hear from you straight away. And I'm going to do my best to hear as many as we can. While you're trying to fix that, we'll hear from you over here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for speaking. I'm a really big fan, Professor Stiglitz. Thank you. Um, so my question is, do you think that a return to US manufacturing is vital for the future of American economic and even social prosperity? And can this be possible given the current state of global supply chains? OK, we'll hold that until we've heard the question over there. Yeah. Professor, Mr. Friedland. Um, You've given us in the last uh, 40 minutes a lot of reason to be very grumpy. So uh, in this context, in this environment, do do you see a kind of social revolution similar to the 1968 French uh, movement uh, on the horizon? Would that make you less grumpy if the answer was... Yes, I think people take it to the streets is a perfect way to uh, make a point. Okay, thank you. And let's see if there's another hand nearby. We'll hear from yeah, the chap here with the T-shirt, I think. There we are. Yes, he is a T-shirt. Yes. OK. I can't see that well here. Yes, there we go. Uh, thank you. Very interesting speech. Uh, I will be straightforward. Don't you think that uh, the end uh, Brexit or the end of the European Union will be very beneficial for countries like America, China, Russia, since it will decrease the bargaining power that uh, other countries like the UK will have after leaving the European Union. What is the type of future you will see if globalization does not work and Brexit becomes hard Brexit? Okay, so let's um, start with, the, the, we'll do them more or less in order actually, but that first one about well, the chances for the United States returning to being a manufacturing force given global supply chains. Yeah, so uh, the way I would frame it is the following, that in some ways the world is, is a victim of its own success. Uh, we've had enormous productivity increases in manufacturing, and those productivity increases have exceeded Uh, the increase in demand. Uh, And the result of that is global employment in manufacturing inevitably is going to go down. You know, that's just the reality uh, that we have to face. In a way, it's not that much different from what happened 100 years ago when productivity in agriculture well exceeded the growth in uh, demand for food. And so we went from a world in which, you know, almost 70% of people were involved in growing the food so to the point where, say, in the United States, 3% of our labor, less than 3% of our labor force produces more food than even an obese society can consume. So uh, we had to adapt to that. We moved from manufacturing to, from, from agriculture to manufacturing. And now we have to move on to a service sector, innovation, other aspects of our economy. Um, there will be particular areas where we can recover uh, some jobs. But this is where Trump is really wrong. Even if manufacturing came back to the United States, it would largely be robots pro- producing our clothes. And it's going to be in different places, and it's not going to be creating the jobs that were destroyed. 
So, and presumably uh, that change will happen to eventually to China too. That they... It's already happened yeah. in China. Employment, manufacturing employment in China is going down. And, and so uh, all countries have to adapt. So there is some scope for a, you might call it a high-tech manufacturing agenda that links innovation, technology, services, say, medical services, you know, diagnostic tools, so bringing AI together. I, I, I don't want to be totally negative on it, but I don't think it will be the basis for uh, maintaining full employment. Uh, I think one has to have a more diversified strategy uh, going forward. And I think uh, um, uh, that's where some of the new jobs will have to think about how do we create those new jobs in other sectors uh, of the economy, both at the high school level and at the uh, low school level. What about our questioner who was looking for reasons to be cheerful and thought the, since we're talking about anniversaries, 10 years since 2008, but also 50 years since 1968, and the sort of sense that there's protest, even revolution in the air. What do you make of that? So, I, the, what gives me some optimism is, is our young people, uh, our students, uh, who are at last getting very engaged. You know, they realize that their future is at stake. And uh, overwhelmingly, they realize in the United States that the direction that we're going is the wrong direction. They don't want to live in a society marked by uh, bigotry, misogyny, uh, nativism that Trump represents. And so I, I, I you know, never seen that kind of energy. Uh, and now the question is, can we channel that energy in a constructive way uh, through our electoral process to, to get the right outcomes? And so, so hopefully we'll see the first fruits of this uh, in November. What about the, f I'm, I'm interested in um, your thoughts on what you, how anything that's made you rethink in the last decade? Question over there. What have you changed your mind on? Well, I guess uh, the one thing I, I've uh, been a little bit amazed is uh, the economics profession and how slow it's been to change. Uh, I understood the difficulties of politics and I understood the difficulties of, you know, special interest. I knew the banks were going to put up a big resistance. And I knew that, you know, if we didn't change our politics, money in politics would enable them to succeed to some extent. But uh, academia is not supposed, it, it, supposed to be a little bit different and it's supposed to be open to learning. And uh, I, I've been a little bit shocked at how recalcitrant uh, so much of the mainstream of the economics profession has been to change their ideas. Now, uh, this really links to, to one of the other questions. Uh, behavioral economics uh, has been a major change and it's being, its voice is being heard more. Um, and an understanding that uh, the basic model that was used before was that everybody was fully rational and it was so clear that people were not rational and that the banks were exploiting their rationalities and uh, that we need regulation to stop them yeah. from exploiting their rationalities. And in, in, in a sense, uh, if you don't do that, the whole system can be bit by that. Um, what worries me, and this is related to one of the other questions, that AI has now given a better tool for exploiting irrationalities, that it, uh, AI can examine patterns of behavior that are irrational and really then exploit them much worse. This is the notion, because I saw you speaking about this earlier this weekend, that with more data, more knowledge about us using our own data, the, the, the big companies, the retailers, the people selling us things can work out exactly vagaries of our behavior that are obscure even to us exactly. and target those vulnerabilities. And you gave the example of somebody, for example, who's a compulsive shopper who needs really to see a doctor, but instead a, you know, a company can pinpoint that weakness. Exactly. And, 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 and identify, so, so one way of thinking about it that we all are familiar with is the uh, airlines always knew that 
they could discriminate between those business travelers and those who just traveled over a weekend. But now they can uh, discriminate more finely because they have all of your history on file. And they actually are now looking as you search in your pattern of search, they can figure out, are you somebody they could charge a little bit more to? Or somebody they should charge a little bit less to? So the basis of our, uh, the efficiency of our economic system that you know, we teach our students is based on what we call the price system, that everybody pays, pays the same price, and that means that the value of a good is the same to everybody. But that's no longer true because the, with, with uh, uh, all this information, Amazon and the other companies can engage in ruthlessly discriminating uh, price discrimination. So that's an example of where a fundamental assumption of economics has been changed, perhaps even in the last decade, by data. Very much so, very much so. And, and you know, it was always true a little bit in pockets, but now it's become pervasive. And, and it really at the danger of, of really undermining, I think, our whole system. So the other big shift was signaled by the question from over here, which was uh, something which perhaps we weren't as, as cognizant of a decade ago, but the energy transition towards renewable energies. And the questioner asked what impact that might have on the global economy and how we see it. Well, I, I, I think this is a fundamental issue that, that unfortunately, uh, in the United States has been obfuscated or undermined by all the other noise uh, that's going on. Um, the, uh, let me just mention one, uh, I'm, I'm uh, involved uh, as an expert, in, uh, uh, we have a legal system that uh, is uh, a, a very rich in, in some ways. Uh, so uh, there are a group of about uh, 18 young people who are suing Trump for uh, violating their constitutional rights uh, by uh, not giving them equal protection, by destroying the environment that they will have to confront when they grow up. And uh, we are going to trial uh, next month. Uh, so, uh, and, and all the best climate scientists uh, are joining in on the suit. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll hold him accountable for, uh, but uh, the, the point is that actually, uh, this is one of those areas that in terms of uh, retrofitting our economy for climate change, uh, a new economy, can be a source of enormous innovation, enormous demand for jobs. Um, one of the, uh, you know, Trump, talked about uh, protecting the coal miners. There are five times as many people in, uh, employed in installation of solar panels than in coal mining. There are more professional athletes in the United States than coal miners by five times. Wow. So, you know, he's focused on a world of 180 years ago. That's gone. And uh, I, I just hope that other countries realize that it's gone, and we're going to try to make that issue clearer and clearer. But you know, if you're going forward, you really are. It's, it's the green economy that is going to be. You know, it's obviously necessary for saving our planet, but it's also actually an important part of saving our economy. But your mention of Trump takes us very nicely to the last question we have left out today, which is about the moral character of leaders. And the question was asking uh, whether or not they, you know, that plays any role, the moral character of politicians, either, I suppose, in the decisions they make or in how they're perceived. Because what it used to be thought of in politics, that if somebody did lacked character, that would rule them out of high <laughs> office. And we've had to rethink that assumption. I, clearly, as clearly. Well. Well, I mean, putting your head both as a citizen of the United States as well as an economist, what do you think is signified by this shift? Well, I, I think uh, it's in a way uh, the continuation of a pattern that had been going on before, and I, I think it is a call for bringing back more language into our politics that, uh, you know, for, for a very long time uh, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, there was a technocratic uh, approach to 
particularly economic policy, but other aspects of policy. So you would talk about win-win solutions. Uh, you would talk about, you know, trickle down. Everybody uh, is going to be better off. Um, you would not want to use uh, language that says it's a moral issue that 20, 25 percent of American children are growing up in poverty. You know, you, you just wouldn't want to use that moral vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You would want to put it as, a, as an economic issue. And I think uh, that taking out of morality from public discourse was probably a mistake. Um, that um, what uh, people care about uh, is obviously much more broader than materialism. And in fact, one of my, uh, in my uh, next book, I'm, uh, one of the points I try to raise is that the way we shaped uh, capitalism under, you might call it neoliberalism or you know, the, the set of rules over the last 25 years has really had an effect on who we are. Uh, if you, know, you, you, if you tell everybody the only thing that counts is materialism, they become more materialistic. Yeah. Uh, there are actually good behavioral economics uh, 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 experiments that have verified this. Uh, if you do experiments uh, ab about honesty and there are ways of te te testing whether people are honest, um, if you uh, do these experiments with bankers and uh, you uh, uh, remind them that they just went to church, uh, they'll be more honest. But if you mention, you ask them, what is your job? And they say bankers. Uh, after they say banker, and you give them this honesty test, they are much more dishonest. <laughs> <laughs> that evidently, uh, being a banker and thinking of yourself as a banker leads people to behave differently. And I think that means that as we think about our economy, we also ought to be thinking about how our rules of the game that I talked about before uh, shape who we are. And that's why, uh, you know, in response to the question before, what, you know, what makes me hopeful, the, the language that the young people are talking about is a moral language. Um, they, they, they're uh, saying, you know, what kind of society do they want to have for the remainder of their lives. And they say it's a different society than they're being passed on. Well, on that note, I think you're going to want to join me in thanking for a very wide-ranging conversation that went from the economy to morality to banking, Joseph Stiglitz. <laughs>